began a, um, <clears throat> we began a series last week, and, and today we're taking really the first main part of it, but I want to set the stage with uh, something from A.W. Tozer, uh, a quote regarding what we're going to talk about today. I know it's kind of small up there, so I'm going to read it for you. Uh, Being made in God's image, we have within us the capacity to know him. In our sins, we lack the power. The moment the Spirit has quickened us to life, our whole being senses its kinship to God and leaps up in joyous recognition. That is the heavenly birth, without which we cannot see the kingdom of God. It is, however, not an end, but an inception. For now begins the glorious pursuit, the heart's happy exploration of the infinite riches of the Godhead. That is where we begin. But where we stop, no one has yet discovered. That's pretty powerful. Uh, if you're familiar with Tozer, he, his writings are uh, they're, they're really deep. They make you think. And Tozer is describing the, the journey of a child of God, a follower of Christ, a, a spirit-filled disciple. And it all begins with salvation, naturally. That's what he's letting us know here, that he, he's not... He's not Uh, trivializing salvation. He's saying that's where it begins. Uh, A lot of people end there. A lot of people, they come to the Lord, it's great, and things change, and they they stop. But that's not where it's supposed to stop. That's where it's supposed to begin. And that's what he's trying to say here. You know, we salvation, we come to a place in our lives where we realize that without God, we have nothing. We come to a place in our lives where we realize that there's a a void inside of us. There's an emptiness. There's you know, we're spinning our wheels in this world and, and, and we think there's, there's got to be something more. And then, then we may hear God's word, whether it's shared by a friend or, or preached or taught or, or we open our Bibles or whatever. So, and then, and then, then the spirit begins to move in us and it begins to say, I'm right here. You got to turn from your sins. You got to turn to me. You got to receive me. You, you gotta, I, I want a relationship with you. And, and, and that is when everything changes. We hear the word of God. We perceive the call of the Father. We, we sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and then we trust in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. That's salvation. And that is glorious. But, and yes, there is a but. But that's not where it ends. I see a lot of people in our world, they'll, they'll come to know the Lord as Savior. And, 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 and it's legitimate. I'm not going to question that. But then they... They don't know where to go from there. It happened to me. Uh, I came to know the Lord. I wasn't at a church. I wasn't at a, uh, um, an outreach event. I, I was at work, and there was a you know, guy there that was working, and he shared the gospel with me, and, and, I, and I, got, I got saved. And, and, and I went the whole first year just kind of like that. It was exciting. I was like, oh, okay, I feel things changing, I, but I didn't know anything. I didn't have God's word. I didn't, I didn't have preaching or teaching or, or, or singing or fellowship or... And, and, I, and I was just kind of like, okay, I, I'm going to heaven. It's great. But what else is there? And I realized that God wants far more for us than just to get our ticket punched to heaven. Uh, in fact, I have a, a statement for you here. God's dream for our lives transcends living the same old ordinary life with a Christian label on it. It happens so much. So many times... And people get saved and they're like, okay, I cleaned up my act a little bit. But it ends up being the same old act. I've turned over a new leaf, but it's really the same leaf. It's, and we just kind of we just kind of uh, stay where we're at. And, but that's, and that's where we're at today. That's where revival comes in. How many of you have ever, how many of you have you heard the word revival in, in a Christian sense? In a Christian sense, okay. Uh, revival is... Spirit-led and spirit-empowered. Uh, it's not man-made. It's not people-driven. It's not uh, um, f- the force of will ignited. It's not something that we, we program. It's not something that we uh, uh, schedule. It's not something that we, we, you know, there's 10 steps that we can do and we will be revived. It's, it's, it's not anything like that. It's divinely appointed and empowered. Revival is not something we learn about and intellectually make happen. Uh, revival is not something that we simply hope for. Revival is something that captivates our hearts and our minds. 
It's something that saturates our prayers. It consumes our dreams and permeates our lives. It's something we cannot produce, but it is something that we can prepare for. And I want you to, there's a big difference between the two. You know, we can stand here, we can try to amp ourselves up. It's easy to do. I can amp myself up just about anything. A movie, uh, 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 some food, or whatever. You know, you, you get yourself pumped up, and you, you, you but then what happens? The pump goes away, and then you're kind of left with the same old, same old. That's not revival. Uh, people also misinterpret revival as being people getting saved. That's not revival either. Revival is for those of us that know Christ as Savior already, who have kind of, you know, we're, we're, we've gone down for the third time in the water, and we're just kind of, you know, going through the motions. We're just kind of living. I like the way G. Campbell Morgan uh, puts it. He says, Revival cannot be organized, but we can set our sails to catch the wind from, God, from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. We can set the stage. We can prepare our hearts. We can't make revival happen. God is the only one that gives life and life everlasting and revival. But we can set the stage. We can prepare our hearts. Uh, Isaiah 57 verse 15 says this. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. God God wants to revive us. God wants us to live in in relationship with him. He wants us to know him and experience him. He wants us to walk in newness of life. Does that sound all right? Yes? Okay. I just want to make sure that you're with me because uh, th- this is too many times we'll hear about what God wants to do and we think, that's nice. And then we kind of walk away. Um, it's, revival is so much more than that. And Stephen Olford, I think, puts it best. He says, revival is an invasion from heaven that brings a conscious awareness of God. You want to know what revival is? I know there's all this mystical, uh, weird stuff that, that we've heard throughout the ages, but you know what revival really is? It's seeing God for who he is and then hungering for more. That's revival. It's, it's getting a glimpse of the majesty and the presence of God and coming to a point where you just can't get enough. That's revival. Revival isn't, um, you know, if I, if I uh, follow these uh, laws, or if I don't do these sins, or if I, the holiness is involved there. We're going to talk about that, but revival is very, very simply defined as seeing God and then wanting more of Him. Seeing God and then wanting more of Him. And, and you know, what does that look like? Remember Job in, in, in the Old Testament. Job, Job was a, um, a good man. In fact, Job may have been the best man on the planet. Okay, and he was so good, in fact, that, that God kind of bragged on him. God kind of lifted him up in front of all of heaven. And the book of Job opens with a scene from heaven. Uh, the Bible, uh, the angelic beings, rather, are coming before the Lord to give account of themselves, according to the passage. And the devil's with them. And yes, the devil has to answer to God for what he does. So they're all, the, all, the, all the angelic beings are before God giving an account of themselves to God. Okay, and look what happens next. In Job chapter 1, verse 8, it says, And the Lord told, uh, said to Satan, have you, considered, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and un- upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Talk about a proud papa. I mean, imagine that. You have, you have the multitudes of heaven standing out there, including the enemy. And what does God say? Did you you see my son? Did you see my servant? You see how good he is? You see what he's doing now? You see these, this, and and he's talking specifically to the enemy. These humans that you hate, you see how good they can be? (laughs) Job was saved. He made sacrifices that pointed to Jesus and, and his work on the cross. Yet, at the end of his trials, and after being in the presence of God, something happened. So, so Job, 
was doing all the right things. He was a religious guy. Uh, and in fact, we, we know that he was offering sacrifices not just for himself, but as the patriarch of the family, he was offering sacrifices for his family as well. He was the high priest of his family. This, is, this predates the Levitical pre priesthood. People speculate that Job may have even been a little bit before Abraham. We know he was before the Levitical priesthood set, uh, was set up. And here he is offering sacrifices to God. Probably got it from you know, his, his uh, uh, great, great, great granddaddy, Adam, and came down the line through Seth, and he's, he's offering sacrifices. So he's saved. He's looking forward to Christ. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Okay, he's walking right. He's avoiding sin. He's, you know, but, but that wasn't enough. There was something else. Something else took place. And take a look here in verse 42, uh, chapter 42, verse 5. Job says something that, for me, changes the entire game. He says, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. You say, what's the big deal about that? Job experienced God. Job knew about God. Job heard about God. Job was doing things to kind of please God. But once he experienced God, everything changed. He went from being a good guy to a godly, revived, passionate man of God. There's a big difference there. Experiencing God changes literally everything. And I got a, a little statement for you here. Revival always begins at the foot of the throne of God, in His presence, experiencing Him on a person, intimate, personal, intimate level. That's where revival always begins. Revival doesn't begin in a church. Revival doesn't begin in a, um, in a, uh, a, a big outdoor event. or, or a, uh, re Revival begins at, in the presence of God. When we see His majesty, when we experience who He truly is, Everything changes. You can't help but want more. You ever have a meal and, you know, you get all the stuff out there, and there, there's one particular dish that's really good, and you just, you know, you go up for seconds or thirds or fifths or whatever the case may be, and you want more of that, right? You ever, you ever, you ever have that? You ever been in, where, where, yeah, the whole meal was good, but that was really good. I want some more of that. When you experience God, when we, when, we, when we get a glimpse of the majesty of God, we just can't help but want more and hunger and thirst for more for, of Him. Now, that, unfortunately, is also the core problem with Christianity, the core problem with the church as a whole. Okay? We, uh, um, and it's been a, a problem for 2,700, well, all, uh, since the beginning of time, but uh, 2,700 years ago, we read something very profound in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, we read, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and the fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. What's he saying here? He's saying, this does nothing. Lip service does nothing. We can say all the right prayers, say all the right words. We can say, God could give us a script and we can read it back to him. And it does nothing. Unless he has our hearts. God wants more than words. He's basically saying here, your religion is stifling your relationship with me. You're simply going through the motions, checking me off the list. And that was a struggle back then. That's a struggle today. You know, we can put... Uh, church, uh, Bible studies, devotional times, prayer times. We can write it in our schedule, and then it becomes something that we get to check off. Or we can crave and hunger and thirst for the ex an experience with God, to be in God's presence, and then it becomes more like a relationship as opposed to a duty. You see the difference there? It's a huge difference. It's night and day difference. I can perform a religious activity or I can passionately pursue a relationship with God. Both are going to produce two very different people. And that's what we're seeing here. Becoming a, a church that is uh, revived in our passion for the Lord means 
to know him, to experience him, to love him, to obey him, to be captivated by him, to be saturated by him, to be, to be consumed with thoughts of him. Brian Edwards, Brian Edwards says it this way. In revival, the minds of people are concentrated upon the things of eternity, and there is an awareness that nothing else really matters. There was a book out there, or, or I don't know, it might have been a book, I know it was a statement. Keep the main thing the main thing. You ever, you ever hear that statement, keep the main thing the main thing? There's only one main thing, and, it, and, it's, and it's Christ. It's Christ. Before I went to school to be a preacher, I was in school for, to, to be a physical therapist. And, and one of the things that, one of the classes that we learned, was, it was like a, it was an expanded, really a, a glorified first aid class. But it was pretty intense. It was something that the paramedics and, 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 and the people that are on the front lines are doing. And, you know, they, they, they would say, you know, the guy's not breathing. He's got a cut on his hand. Don't take care of the cut. <laughs> Keep the main thing the main thing. Get that guy breathing again, you know. Uh, he's got something sticking out of his leg, but he's not breathing. What do you do? Get him breathing again. Picture all of life, everything in life, as that cut. And the only thing that we need the most is God. Is that breathe, we got to be breathing it. We got to be revived. We got to we got to come to, uh, to an, an experience with Him. At the core of Christianity, there are two transcending desires. At the very core, the first one is uh, a desire on the heart, uh, on the part of God for the hearts, minds, bodies, and spirit of his people. God doesn't want a, a plastic relationship. None of us want a plastic relationship with anybody, for crying out loud, you know. And we, we have them, though, right? We have, we have some people that we just kind of, hey, how you doing? Good, okay, that, that's good. And you, you, there's not really a lot of engagement. We've got those, you know. You see the same person at the store uh, a few weeks in a row, and, you know, you say hi, and, yeah, how you doing? Great, okay, good, thank you. Have a great day. And, and you go on. And you may pray for that person, you may care for that person, that's good. But that's very, very different than going home to your wife or going home to your husband. There's a difference there. God doesn't want that, that surfacey, hey, how's the weather doing today kind of relationship. He has a desire for us to know him personally, personally and pursue him passionately. He wants us to, to go beyond knowing about him and pursue a passionate relationship with him. That's the first great desire. The second great desire is our response. It begins with God. It doesn't begin with us. We don't come into this world and say, you know what? I need to pursue God. God does the, God does the, the initiating. God does, the, God does the, uh, the, the courting, so to speak, the pursuing, so to speak. But we get an opportunity to respond. And, and the second great uh, desire, transcending desire, is where we develop an all-consuming passion to know him more. Not know about him more, although that's part of it. You've got to know about him too. But to know him, to experience him more. And, and you know, revival, uh, that's, that's, that's revival. It's, it's to pursue God more and more each day. Revival happens when two things take place. This is not your note yet. Revival happens when we experience God. The psalmist writes, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Uh, poetic uh, Hebrew poetry, taste and see means to experience God, to know God. You, 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 get, you get a glimpse of God, you get, and, 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 and then things begin to happen. It goes far beyond uh, facts and figures and stories and songs and preaching and teaching and and, and it, it, go, it goes to the point of, I experienced God. I experienced God. And that leads to us passionately pursuing God. Uh, Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. This verse always reminds me, we have as much of God as we want. Is it an accurate statement to say that God is infinite and eternal? Yes. How many agree? Yes? Yes. Which means you can never want more than what God is capable of giving. 
You can never want more of God than what he's capable of giving of, of himself. I can never crave, I, I can never get to a point in my life where I'm saying, God, I just want more. And he says, sorry, I don't have any more of me to give you. Never does that take place. He's infinite and eternal. Now, here's the catch. That means no matter where I am in life, from birth until death and beyond, that I only have as much of God as I actually want. You understand, you understand that? If, if you had in your backyard an unending well of sweet tea, unending, okay, I caught Kevin in the corner of my eye. I know they like sweet tea down in, down in the south. And so you have an unending well of sweet tea, unending. It will never run out. And you go out and you get a cup and you drink it. And you go out again, you get a cup and you drink it. Are you going to ever empty the well? It's an unending well. No trick question. Are you ever going to empty the well? No. So that means you only, whenever you go out and get, that's, you have as much as you, as you want, Right? God is an unending well of majesty and, and goodness and love and, and grace and mercy and, and him, himself, which means we have as much of him as we want. And that's what this verse tells us. This is the key to revival. We don't generate any of this. We experience God. We taste and see that he is good. And then that produces in us a desire to know him more. It's like going to that, you take a drink of that sweet tea, and you're like, i got to get more of that. And you keep going and going and going. Only with God, it's got a far deeper meaning, even this sweet tea. Yeah. So the big question is, how much of God do we really want? Revival takes place when we continue to crave and hunger day by day, moment by moment, more of him. Now, some of you may be thinking, that all sounds great, but I, I've never felt God palpably. I've never experienced him to that depth. You may be thinking, you know, I love him. I've trusted him for heaven, but I, I've never really had that deep spiritual experience. You, you may be feeling that. You may be thinking that. And that may make you feel inept. That may make you feel unspiritual. That may even make you doubt your salvation. Because you think, oh, there's people around me that they just can't seem to get enough of God. And I, I just, I don't, I don't, I'm not like that all the time. I don't, I, I don't, I don't always, I'm, I'm not always thinking about him 24-7. It's not, you, you, that may be you. That may be all of us. Please don't beat yourself up. Like I said earlier, revival is not some man-generated thing that we can program. We can't amp it up and say, okay, now, now I'm spiritual. Now I'm like Job. In that situation with Job, who approached who? Did Job approach God or did God approach Job? God approached Job. God revealed himself to Job. And Job saw him and then Job's life was changed. We can't generate this. We can't make this happen. Revival always begins with God. So if you're that person that says, man, I just, I, I, I hear about this all the time. I hear about this, this, this spiritual craving and hunger and, and heart desire for God. And, and, and I love them and I want more, but ah, I just don't know if I have it as much as the next guy or the next gal. I've got really good news for you. We can't generate we can't produce revival, but we can certainly prepare for it. Take a look here at uh, Psalm 27, verse, verse 8. It says, when you said, seek my face. You know, sometimes when we read scripture, we just kind of fly through. Like, oh yeah, that was really good. Okay. When you seek, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. You see the, the process here? Our job is to be ready for him when he says, okay, seek my face. That's what our job is. Our job is to be prepared. Our job isn't to generate that. Our job is to always be, be ready, always be in anticipation of when God is ready to revive our spirit to a different degree, to a different level. To, and I'm not talking about there's levels of Christianity. That, that's, that's puny and that's man-made stuff when you think that, when you start thinking that way, like, oh, they're a, that's a super saint, and, and I'm just a, 
we're all just a, a, a person. But when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. We got to be ready. We got to prepare it. Uh, how many of you uh, ever done any kind of gardening at all or flowers and stuff like that, right? Do you, you know, take the packet of seeds, throw it on the ground and say, grow? I w- that would be great because I, you know, some people have a green thumb. My thumb is black to the core. And whatever I touch doesn't turn green, doesn't turn to gold. It usually dies because I, I don't have that skill, okay? But I do know enough. I have a, and oddly enough, uh, one of my uncles is, was one of the most successful farmers in, uh, in New, upstate New York. And he, he grew acres upon hundreds and hundreds of acres of corn and all kinds of stuff. And I noticed they prepared the ground first. And then they planted the seed. And then they continued to water it. And then they continued to take care of it and weed it. And eventually it would produce something. We've got to prepare our hearts. And how do we do that? You can follow along in your notes. Um, again, this is not a, a, I think I got four points here. It's not a, a four point way to be revived. This is how we prepare our hearts for when God is ready to revive us. I do sense, I do sense Him calling me, uh, uh, speaking to my heart. I do sense revival sprouting within myself. And typically that means if anybody is in your life circle, it's happening with other people too. You're not the only one. Last week we said, keep in mind, uh, you're not the only one that God is working in. So I know if God is doing that in my heart, I know he's doing it in, in many of yours as well. So, so how, do we, how do we prepare? How do we set the stage? Well, first, repent. It begins with repent. You've got to be saved in order to be revived. So I, I, think, I think we already established that. But now we've got to repent of our sin. Joshua, the, our verse from last week, and Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves for the Lord for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. This is, this is no mystery. God wants us to, to be pure, holy, clean. God wants us to, 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 to take this book seriously and, and to follow this and to follow a path of, of righteousness. He, you know, revival isn't do whatever you want and, and have an experience of God. It doesn't, you can't have one without the other. You've you got to be pursuing him and obeying him and following him and hungering for that purity to be in his presence. Otherwise... Otherwise, when we're in his presence, we feel even dirtier than before. You ever, you ever get caught off God and you were, you were somewhere where you were supposed to be dressed a certain way? You know, you were at an event or something like that and you didn't really, you didn't really research it enough. You didn't really find out all the details. And, and you go to the event and, you know, you got your jeans on and your T-shirt and everybody else has a, a tie on and, 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 or, or a dress, not a tie and a dress, a tie or a dress or something. They're all dressed, and you're like, I feel a little out of place here. You, you ever been in a situation anywhere? Like, or, or how about this? Um, I, I remember working with Brian one time, and, and when, you, when, when you work with Brian, you work with Brian, okay? It's, you don't get the, what do we call him, Brian? What do we call these guys? Leaners, right? You, you work, and, and, and you know, it's, it, you get you, you know, you get little cuts and, you, and, you, and your hands get... And I remember one time, Brian, it was like we were done like at three or four in the morning or something like that. And I went to the store on the way home and I wanted to get a sweet tea. <laughs> and I get in and I went to grab a sweet tea and I looked at my hand. And I thought, oh my goodness, you are one dirty dog. It was just full of stuff. It was, it was... You know what I did? I put it down. I walked out of the store. I was embarrassed because I was like, I don't want that. I don't want anybody to see me like this. You ever been in a situation, anything, where you don't feel like you're... God says, repent. He says, I love you the way you are. Keep this in mind. I, I love you the way you are, but I love you far too much to let you stay that way. I love you the way you are, but I love you far too much to let you stay that way. <laughs> you know, when you have, an, have people over your house, what do you do to the house? There's a Pittsburgh term for it. What do you do? You read up, Right? You read up. It's one of the Pittsburgh terms that I actually like. You read up. What does that mean? You clean up. You straighten up. Maybe you cook some food. You get things prepared, right? Well, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, listen to what Robert Coleman says. Revival is that sovereign work of God 
in which he visits his own people, restoring and releasing them into the fullness of his blessing. He visits us. He comes into our lives in a, in a unique and powerful way, and, and, and we want to be ready. We, repentance prepares our hearts to be in the presence of God. First uh, John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So God doesn't say, uh, repent, good luck, we'll see what happens. He says, he says, if you turn from your sins and you turn to me, I'm going to forgive you. He's faithful. He, he, he does this for us. So what I'm asking for us this week is to do a little house cleaning. It is throughout the week, go before the Lord asking them to reveal what's going on in our lives that doesn't belong there, and then, and then confess it and repent of it. As a matter of fact, we're going we're gonna to do that right now as a faith family. I can't pray for your sins. I'm not a magic priest or anything like that. But as a faith family, why don't we bow our heads for a moment and go before the Lord? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just to be before your throne is breathtaking. Father, just to be in your presence is humbling. Just to be able to call out your name, just to be able to call you Father, is beyond our wildest imagination. Lord, we come before you today as a faith family, as the body of Christ, as a church, as an ecclesia. We come before you, Lord, and we ask that you would cleanse us and purify us. As a, as a body of believers, Lord, we ask that you would, uh, we, we tell you, we repent. We, we are not a perfect church. There is no such thing. We've done some things right. We've done some things wrong. But Lord, we come before you now. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your cleansing. We ask for your purification. We repent, Lord. We want to prepare our hearts for your invasion, for your presence, for your, your majesty. I ask, Lord, that you would, you would speak to us today, that you would draw us closer to you, that you would help us to walk in newness of life, in purity and in holiness and in righteousness, not as a, as a judgmental Pharisee, Lord, so that we can point fingers at others or, or even each other, but so that we can shine with your light. Lord, we love you so very much. We thank you. We know, Father, according to who you are, that you've heard these prayers before the foundations of the world and have answered them. We thank you, Lord. We come to you humbly in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Repent of our sins. How else do we prepare our hearts? Reflect on our salvation. Psalm 51.12 says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. In order for something to be restored, it had to have once been what? Kind of faded away. Kind of, you know, people restore cars. I, I, uh, I remember uh, my father-in-law had a, a van. This was years ago when I first met him. He had this, this van and, and he was out there and he was body putty and, and, and all kinds. And he, he restored the van. We, you restore something that once was maybe pretty good that has kind of gotten worn down and then you restore it back to a good place. Uh, restore, the psalmist writes, restore the joy of thy salvation. Sometimes we can get so caught up in the chaos of the world that we forget just how amazing God's grace truly is. You ever been there? You ever been like, I, uh, it just hits you out of the blue like, huh? wow, God has done amazing things. God has reached me, and, and it hits you out of the blue, and you think, Oh my goodness. You know what happens to me? I think, I can't believe I haven't thought about this every moment of every day. <laughs> um, we can get uh, distracted by the shiny stuff in this world only for it to be revealed to be junk uh, um, compared to, to salvation. Vance Havner put it this way, revival is a church falling in love with Jesus all over again. <laughs> now, Consider what he's trying to say here, okay? He's not saying, you know, you, you got to do a bunch of stuff. saying your heart is passionately pursuing God all over again. You're falling in love with God all over again. 
Remember when you first, remember when you first came to know the Lord? Remember what took place in your heart? Remember the, the excitement? Remember the, the enthusiasm? Remember the, I, I remember, I, I mean, I was, I was 20 years old. I just turned 20. And I remember thinking, I was, I was dead for 19 years. And now I'm alive. It hit me like a ton of bricks. It was out of the blue. I, I, you know, my, my friend, like I said, from work had been witnessing to me for like a, a year. And then finally I got on my knees and I was like, Lord, okay, I'm yours. I, I turn from my sin. I turn to you. I place my faith, my hope, my trust in, in, in your Savior. And I'm not going to say that there were bright lights and loud noises and a booming voice from heaven, but something supernatural took place and everything changed. And all of a sudden I was, I was lit up. I was taken off life support and given real, true life. I was moving and, and, and breathing. It felt like for the first time. The psalmist says that. He says, restore that. Restore that to me. Restore that, that childlike exuberance, that, that childlike faith, that excitement, that love, that passion. And he says, like Vance Havner says, Fall in love with Jesus all over again. You know, we can do that every day. You can fall in love with Jesus every single day. You can fall in love with Jesus every single moment all over again. So this week, you know, we're talking about what we can do to prepare. So repentance, we want to be re repenting and preparing our hearts. But we also want to uh, be remembering the joy of our salvation. Here's a way to do that. Maybe sometime this week, just for yourself, take a piece of paper or your journal, or your Bible, and write down your testimony. Write down what happened, what it was like when you first got saved. Write down some details. Write down who shared the gospel with you. Write down where you were. Write down, maybe if you remember what you were wearing or what was going on around you, maybe you know, write out your testimony and, and then keep it and, and ask God to restore uh, the joy of your salvation. From there, uh, we reach for a, a significant encounter with God. Now, what does that even mean? Well, you're only going to find what you're looking for. You ever notice that? You really only find what you're looking for. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. After ye shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. There's no more powerful passage about being revived, about pursuing God than this. And, you know, God is not playing some galactic game of hide-and-go-seek. He, he wants us to know him. He wants us to experience him. The problem isn't how we look. Hey, have, you ever, have you ever lost something and went to where you thought it was and looked for it and it wasn't there, and you walked away, and a few minutes later you go back to that spot like it miraculously popped up, and you look again, and you walk away, you think, ah, where is this? You know, me, I yell out to Angela, Angela, did you see my whatever? And, and you, you, know what I, you know what I do? I go back again. <laughs> it wasn't there the first five times, but maybe it's there now. Any of you, please, any of you guys, guys, you ever do that? And then what happens is later on in the day, you realize that it was never there in the first place, that you had put it over here. You were looking in the wrong place. Right? You ever, that, that happens. Or, or, or you ever look for something and you're intent and you're like, I, I, this happens with me and Angela a lot. And I'll, I'll say, honey, I, I, can't, I can't find it. And she'll, she'll come over, she'll reach over my shoulder, she'll move something and there it is. Behold! It kind of materializes. I'm thinking, she's got some dark magic going on. Right? You're just going to move because something's in the way. Or my all-time favorite. You're looking for something. And you get a picture of what it looks like in your mind. And it's staring you right in the face, but it looks different than the picture in your mind and you can't see it. You ever been there? Oh my goodness, I hate that one the most. I'm looking for a particular tool and I'm thinking, I know, okay, that, that tool's got a, an orange and black handle and I'm looking. And then all of a sudden, there it is, because it's got, it's got a blue handle, but it looked different than what my head said. Uh, please, Brian's nodding. This happens, this happens to you all the time, brother, right? 
And, and it's because, you know, we, it's because we had a particular picture of what it was supposed to look like that we were looking for, but it happened to be something else. These things happen all the time. Sometimes these ha- things happen when we're looking for God. We wander around looking in the wrong place. Or, or we get distracted by things that get in the way. Or we have a picture of what God is supposed to be doing in that situation or the way he's supposed to be manifesting himself or the way he's supposed to answer our prayer and it turns out to be he's doing something very different and we miss it. You see, God, we meet God on his terms, not ours. It's not a a self-made religion. It's not a self-made religion. God's going to meet us on his terms because he is God, not on ours. And, and this week we need to honestly go before his word and say, Lord, show me who you are. Show me what you're doing. Whatever it is, I know I've got hopes and desires, and this, but yours, yours trumps mine. Yours transcends mine. And let's go before the Lord and reach for him on his terms. Our final one is to remain in God's presence. Settle in. Uh, we are not, as a people, we are not... Um, long-distance runners when it comes to life. We're more sprinters. We want what we want. We want it now. Uh, Listen to Psalm 27, verse 4. It says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell, the word dwell means staying there for a while, in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Here's the problem. We, We want immediate results. We're conditioned for it. Our society says, I want what I want, and I want it right now. That's what our society is. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't deny it. We've got things like um, fast food and overnight shop, shopping and, and instant messaging and express lines. We've got all the stuff that, that can speed life up to get us what we want. Uh, uh, how many of you have Amazon Prime? Okay. How many of you guys, that's how you did your Christmas shopping this year? Was it? Yeah, it's the greatest thing. You order it today, two days later, Bam, there it is. You don't even have to go into those stores and fight all the people and try to search through. You just go online, boom, done. And it's there in two days. And heaven forbid if it comes in three days. Because then there's a problem. Now Amazon and I have have an issue. It only happened a couple times. I ordered something. They said two-day delivery, but it depends on when in the day that you deliver, that you order, I found out. And here I am. And it's it's day two comes. I'm like, ooh, those, ooh, I'm going to. I'm going to talk to that guy. Well, I'm not really going to talk to that guy, but I want to. We want what we want, and we want it right now. If we had, if we, if, if Amazon offered uh, next hour delivery, how many of us would jump on that? Right? I want it. Give it to me right now. I'd order my food that way. <laughs> I would say, Amazon, I, you know, I, 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 want a, I want a steak and cheese sandwich. Get it to me in an hour. Boom, there it is. That'd be great. Here comes the guy, you know, in his truck, and he gives me my nice warm sandwich, and I can eat it. We want what we want, we want it now. But God doesn't work that way. God says, You're, you need to dwell with me. You need to, you need to, to, to wait on me. You need, to, you need to remain in my presence. In, in fact, in fact um, and it's not idle waiting. It's waiting with a purpose. It's waiting, seeking, and searching. Many times the waiting is the point. As we wait in the presence of God, as we remain in the presence of God, we're growing, we're changing, we're learning. And you may go to the Lord for, for a particular prayer. This ever happened? You go to the Lord, you pray for something. And after a while, you realize, no, I, 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 that's, I don't really want that. It's okay. Whatever you decide, Lord. You ever, you ever been there? You pray for the Lord, like, like I, Lord, I want this, that. And then I think, you know what, God, whatever you, whatever you want. What, why, how does that take place? You spend time with the Lord, and, and your heart begins to change to be more like his heart. And it begins beating in time with his heart. There's a great thing, uh, um, illustration of that with, with shepherds. And God is the great shepherd and, and, and sheep, and we're, we're sheep. And, you know, when, when a particular uh, uh, young sheep is, is anxious because of wolves or whatever, the shepherd will scoop him up and hold him to him tightly. And, and, and sit down and lean up against a tree. And the sheep's heart is pounding like a, like a drum, like a, like a machine gun. But the shepherd is calm. Something, it's called a sympathetic response. Something interesting takes place. Eventually, that beating heart slows down and begins to beat in exact time with the shepherd's heart. 
as he's holding on. And now the shepherd, could, you know, the sheep could feel it through the, through the skin. And, and, and eventually, that both hearts are beating in unison. That's incredible. That's not going to happen if the shepherd says, hey, sheep, calm down. That happens when the sheep is there in, his, in the shepherd's presence and just remains there until he's calm. And then the, the shepherd will let him go and he goes off and, and does sheep things. Right? It's a beautiful picture. That's what we need to be doing. We need to remain in God's presence. There's a, and that's how we eagerly anticipate revival. Now, and I'm saying this because we go before the Lord today, we repent, and, 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 and we prepare our hearts, and then tomorrow we don't feel revival, it doesn't work. And we walk away. God says, what are you doing? You're not ready. Remain in my presence. Remain in my presence. There's a story of a, of a traveler who uh, he heard about a revival that was uh, transforming Western Europe in, in the early 1900s. People from all over Europe were, were flooding the area. Um, they wanted to be a part of what God was doing. When his train arrived, he got out and, and he found a, 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 a train worker, somebody who was out working on the, on the docks there. And, and, he, and this is what he asked him. He said, how do I find the church where Evan Roberts is preaching? The one where revival is taking place. So he's he heard, hears about the revival. He's like, I gotta go. I gotta go see what's happening here because people literally from all over Western Europe were flooding this town. This is what the man said, "Sir, you just start walking. God's presence will draw you in. I want to be that kind of church. I want to be. I want to be that kind of person, where where I'm so prepared." I'm so hungering, I'm so thirsting for the presence of God that, that people recognize that. People see the hand of God in my life, in our lives, in what takes place from us outside of these walls. That's, that's revival. That's an authentic, captivating, irresistible church. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and, and close, your, close your eyes. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, it begins with salvation. If you don't know the Lord as Savior, that's where you got to start. If, if you don't, if you came in today, you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, uh, you don't know for sure if you're going to heaven, you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you have a, a relationship with him, you don't have to go another second. If God has spoken to you, if you, if you have sensed his presence in any way, shape, or form through his word here, you can respond. You can say, Lord, I, I, I turn from my sins. I hear your voice. I turn from my sins. And you can say, Lord, I, I turn to you, and, and, and as best as I know how, I place my faith, my hope, and my trust in your risen Savior. Save me. You know, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. My Bible says if, if that's the prayer of your heart, if that's the desire of your heart right now, my Bible says you are transformed. No, you, don't, you may not see the bright lights and the, and the crazy noise. Your experience is probably going to be very different than what mine was. Our, we're all unique, and God reaches us where we are and brings us to where he is. But if you did call upon his name today, please, before you leave, let me know. Get my attention. Let me know, because I want to pray for you. We'll take some time out. We'll go, we'll go to another part of the building. We'll go upstairs, whatever. We'll go to the side. And I, I would love to pray for you and keep you in my prayers throughout the rest of the week. For those of us that do know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, has God been whispering to your heart lately? Has God been speaking to you in a... Uh, he's always speaking. He's always there. He's, he's omnipresent. And, but has he, been, has, been, has he been impressing upon you lately to know him deeper, to know him more? Has he been calling to you? That could be God saying, it, it, it's, it's time for you to be revived. It's time for you to know me more than you've ever known me before. It's time for uh, that, like a, a, a great father with a child say, hey son, hey daughter, let's, we're going to spend some time together. Just you and me. 
God has been speaking to you that way, you are on the cusp of revival. No, it's not some super weird, super uh, um, plastic, super programmed thing. It is so much more. God is speaking to your heart. Answer him. You can say, Lord, I, I, I do hunger for you. I do thirst for you. I do want more of you. And the incredible thing is, he will always answer that prayer. Father, we love you so very much. Lord, we come before you, uh, all walks of life, all different stages, uh, uh, where we are and where we're heading. And uh, we got a lot, of, a lot of stuff in our lives. And each of us has, uh, we call it our, our life luggage. Each of us has a bunch of different stuff going on. But there's only one of you. And we hunger and thirst for you. And I know that you've spoken uh, to me, Lord. You've spoken to my heart. And, and, and I know that you're speaking to others. And, and Lord, I just ask that you would continue to draw us into a passionate pursuit of you. We love you. We come to you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.